silence settled in. The creaks, the groans, the screams, it all stopped. And the quiet seemed to weigh heavier with every passing second as I sat there coddling my slashed foot. Nothing moved in the shadows, nothing malicious, cryptic, or compelling, nothing beckoning. The air remained still, and an eerie sense of an ominous something's patient amusement surrounded me, suffocating me. Whether a terrible fever dream, or some twisted perversion of reality, the nightmare around me obviously had no intention of progressing until I made the next move. It whatever it was, had grown tired of prodding and provoking, deciding instead to stand back and observe the effects of my torment. It wanted to see what I would do next. How would I cope with such a hopeless predicament? Or if I would simply break? I would ordinarily say entertaining the idea of some faceless, formless entity, let alone ominous it paints a portrait of textbook dissociative identity disorder. And then again, how many of those afflicted ever questioned their sanity? How many actually resisted the idea of their lingering other? The question didn't justify the implication of reality by any means, but it did bring something less explainable by reason. My fever was getting worse, and the pain in my foot was spreading, becoming a threatening numbness. Combined with my hunger, I wasn't going to last very long. I didn't like the idea of entertaining it at any expense, but I had to do something. I had to take care of the sickness if I wanted to survive, and the first aid kit in the emergency storage didn't have what I needed. So I chewed up a couple of painkillers, wrapped my foot in gauze, and hoped it would be enough to get me to the medical ward. Alternating between braving the pain of walking and relative relief of crawling, I made my way through the remaining length of the corridor to the lower deck access elevator. Of course, right on cue, the cacophony of wrenching, clanking, creaking, and clattering in the middle distance continued. The screams returned as well, louder, clear, and unmistakable. I attempted to outrun them, climbing down the elevator shaft's maintenance scaffolding and nearly falling to my death more than once. But it did me no good. The hallucinations, if they were hallucinations, continued to grow worse. They became aggressive and deliberate. Soon, the voices were joined by flashing visions of human forms, not always familiar, standing in the visible gaps between broken and open airlock portals, turning corners and slinking away into shadows. At first, they appeared ordinary, if distant, but began to deteriorate growing grotesque, uncanny, and unsettling. They appeared again and again, sometimes bald, sometimes pale and thin, sometimes nude and covered in sickly yellow blotches, and sometimes combinations of these things. They wailed and moaned, shambled and wandered, hunched over and limp, all except for one. At the far end of the corridor, just before the next intersection, stood a small, frail-looking girl. She was bald like the rest, nude and pale, and the entirety of her eyes were a deep, solid, gray-like, polished coal. She stood silently and smiled at me, wordlessly daring me to follow as she turned the corner. I heard her playful giggle echo from the walls. I was terrified, but I had come too far to turn back. Afraid of losing her, I bolted through the remainder of the hallway, shivering every time a cold hand brushed over my skin and my injured foot screamed with pain. I staggered to a halt and rounded the corner only to find that she had disappeared. No doors lined that hallway. It was just a service tunnel. Yet, I found myself staring into over 100 meters of empty space, the last sound of her laughter still ringing at the far end. Confusion only gripped me for a matter of seconds before a flash of pain shot up my leg. The painkillers weren't working. I needed something stronger. The little girl would have to wait. My priority still lay in reaching the infirmary. I wasn't looking forward to patching myself up with my basic, less than impressive first aid field training. But it had to be done. My compromised immune system wouldn't let me put it off for much longer. The pain had become unbearable, and each step opened the wound further. I took to hopping the rest of the way on my other foot. 
which came to an end when I landed on a steep angle of another upturned floor panel. I stumbled to the side as I fought for solid footing, and a painful snap sounded from my ankle. I wailed in agony, and my stiffened body fell like an overturned log. Through tears and breathless sobs, I shakily turned the flashlight on the sharp white of a compound fracture piercing my skin, and my brutally twisted foot trembled with the trauma. I rested my head against the unforgiving floor and resigned. There was nothing more I could do. The addition of the new pain had effectively left me paralyzed. I could hardly move, and there was no more denying it. I would die in those tunnels. Inglorious and alone.